Hello, everybody. I'm just waiting to check that this is working. Um, I've had to set up a few different things on the screen to show you what I want to show you um, at the same time as talking to you, um, because there's an awful lot to cover in this talk. Um, and as Danielle Beck knows, who invited me to this conference, I could talk about wolf dogs and the lupine dog breed forever. Um, so I need to make sure that I've got my little um, points there to make sure I don't go completely off topic. Um, don't get sidetracked and don't stay on one topic for too long, otherwise we won't cover everything. Um, I mean, to be honest, we're not going to be able to cover everything anyway, because it is a massive, massive topic. But I'm going to do my best. Um, I've done a fair few of these kinds of talks. Um, at um, a lot of events, um, the National Dog Show, um, Crufts, um, Dogs Fest, all that kind of stuff. So, although I am pretty out of practice because obviously we haven't had any of those events um, for, you know, obviously for some time now because of COVID. So I might be a little bit out of practice with this, so I do apologize. Um, I will be monitoring your comments on a different um, screen because I have to have um, everything on, on my screen in front of me um, with the, the spreadsheet on, um, not the spreadsheet, the the, um, the display on. So um, so we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to see if um, people obviously uh, wake up because it's nice and early. Bella, don't be silly. Bella's crying now. Um, so um, yeah, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes for people to see if, if they're awake. Um, and uh, and then we'll get started. Um, the other thing is there is a delay of around a minute between what I'm saying and what you're going to be hearing. So uh, we basically will just uh, I'll keep an eye on the comments, um, but just be aware if I don't answer you straight away, it's because there's a delay between the comments and, and, and what I'm talking about. The other thing is as well, it may be something that I'm going to cover. Um, so I won't obviously spend time covering it and then because I'm going to cover it again. Um, so in that case, I'll just sort of mention you and say, I'm going to get to that. Um, and then obviously you'll know that it, the answer is coming. <laughs> I'm just going to grab a drink. Hope you've all got your teas and coffees. I've got my my smoothie, and um, and we'll get going in just a just a couple more minutes. So at the moment we've got three of the five um, wolfies in here with me. Um, I've got little puppy Lumi just down here on the floor. She's got a little frozen bone, a uh, hollowed out marrow bone that's stuffed with uh, raw mints um, that she's munching. Um, and then mummy Bella um, and Millie are over there um, just chilling out. Zeus and Toki have decided to stay in bed with daddy. Um, I can't say I blame them. <laughs> so. Morning, Neil. Make sure the sound is off on my phone as well. Okay, awesome. Right, I'm going to get started. We've got, uh, we've got eight people in here. Morning, Neil. <laughs> um, so, what is a wolf dog? Um, in the broadest sense of the term, it is any dog that has wolf-specific DNA in it. Um, and this covers a huge, huge, huge range of dogs. Um, anything from the dogs that you can see there on the screen, which belongs to a very dear friend of mine. Um, she's called Evie. Um, she's uh, a advanced lupine dog. Um, she has around 95% wolf specific DNA. Um, the rest of her is Great Pyrenees. Um, all the way down to animals like my boy Zeus, um, who has almost no wolf specific DNA. He's got 1.3%, which is um, like the tiniest amount. It's not even worth it. Um, but in the eyes of the law, um, in most places, he would still be considered a wolf dog. Um, so it's something that 
um, it covers a huge range of animals and within that range there is a huge amount of variety as well. Um, now wolf dogs they come from a few different places so in America primarily um, they started off in um, fur farms. Um, people bred uh, wolves to dogs to make it easier to manage um, the animals that they were keeping for fur basically you know obviously they wanted to have as many as possible and in a small amount of space as possible um, and as we know um, wild animals do not do very well in those situations and the pelts would um, decrease in quality and things like that so by mixing a, a small amount of dog in um, they could modify the the wild animal behaviors enough that they could sort of have more um obviously not something that's very nice um but um but yeah that, that's how they sort of started in america in europe there was some of that as well um but it was actually more two um two separate breeders um with two separate projects um there was a gentleman who wanted to create uh dogs to be used as guide dogs and there was um a gentleman who wanted to create um more efficient animals for military use and we're going to come to both of those two later on um, because they are actually two defined specific breeds they're recognized by the fci um which is the international kennel club for those of you that don't know who the FCI are um, and um, so yeah so they come from a, a little bit of a different background and as you can imagine they are very different to the American wolf dogs so um, hybrids is the next uh, next bit we've got on here so hybrids is is a bit of a, a complicated term when it comes to wolf dogs because generally within the community if you say hybrid that means it is a first generation cross between a wolf and a dog and very very few people do that there's a very small amount of uh breeders in russia who still do it but that's pretty much the only place in the world that are, are doing that kind of thing um for several reasons one it's just um not the best idea unless you really know what you're doing um because obviously those first generation animals um are you know still pretty uh, pretty intense um uh, the other thing as well is obviously it's not legal in most places um, in the UK, for example, um, you're looking at an F3, uh, which is a felile generation of three. So that is a great grandchild of a wolf before they are legal. So the offspring of a wolf and a dog and their offspring are not legal to own in the UK unless you have a dangerous wild animal license. Um, and there's similar regulation in most of Europe, um, it, though it does vary. I know some places they have to be F5. Some places are a little bit more lenient. Um, in America, it, America is a minefield. Um, and I won't get into the American politics of wolf dogs too much because honestly, you could go 50 miles and it could change um it is is mad in some places you can you can just own a wolf and it's fine in some places you can't have an animal even with one percent of wolf in it um so it, it's it's a it's a big gray area in america um and it's because of the way their legal system works um so you have to be very aware of that if you live in america and you're looking at getting a wolf dog um because there's, there's a lot of legislation there that changes very dramatically from place to place. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a bit of a difficult one. Um, so, so yeah, generally we don't use the term hybrid for wolf dogs because it gives the wrong impression. It makes people think that they're a straight cross between wolves and dogs and they're not. Um, also, there is obviously the gray area of the fact that wolves and dogs are technically classified as the same species. They're just different subspecies. So is hybrid the correct term? Maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe it's intra versus inter. The, the, yeah, so we tend to use the, just the term wolf dog because they're part wolf, part dog. Some set up pretty easily and it, it includes obviously the dog part rather than just wolf hybrid, which you, you do get people who are less than ethical, um, who will use um, the word hybrid to sort of sexy up their selling of their dogs. Yeah, I've got wolf hybrids. Ooh, ooh. No, no, you've got wolf dogs. And a lot of the time, the people who use the term wolf hybrids um, have very, very low content wolf dogs. Some of them actually end up not having any content in them at all. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. So we don't really use the term hybrids um, unless we are talking about the first generation crosses, of which there are very, very few. Um, so, Oh, we've just got one question. Uh, let's stop it with this. 
currently spinning wool. The uh, wolf dogs. Um, I would think so. They produce an awful lot of fur in the spring. Um, so um, yeah, farmer, if you wanna if you wanna drop me a message or uh, pop something in the comments after this, um, I'm sure I could send you um, a bunch of their fur <laughs> for you to have a go at because I have a lot of it. <laughs> um, Perfect. So, uh, so moving on. So, content. Um, now, this is a word. If you're within the wolf dog community, you will hear thrown around an awful lot. Um, and that is, content is basically how much wolf is in this animal. Um, now, before DNA testing was a big thing, and before it was accurate. Um, this used to be based on a phenotypical um, evaluation of the animal. So how does it look? How does it act? Um, you know, what traits is it displaying, basically? The problem with this is if you've got badly socialized animals, um, they can act way more wolfy um, than they actually are. Um, so this can throw things out quite a lot. Um, generally now, when talking about content level, um, people are talking about the amount of wolf-specific DNA um, that is in that animal. Um, so it ranges, but the general consensus, this varies a little bit from person to person, but the, the sort of like the general consensus within the wolf dog community is anything below 50% is considered a low content wolf dog. Anything from about 50% up to about 85 is considered a high is considered a mid content wolf dog, and they do sometimes split it between low mid mid and high mid. Um, and then anything sort of 85% and above, uh, sometimes 90% and above, depending on who you speak to, is considered a high content wolf dog. Um, and the, the thing with the high contents is they visibly um, should be, what, well, they say they should be indistinguishable from the wild animal looks wise. So like Evie, um, who's on that picture there with me, um, you know, she would not look out of place uh, trotting through the tundra. Um, at, you know, she, she looks like a wolf and that is because, you know, genetics wise, DNA wise, she, she is, you know, she's mostly wolf. So she's going to look like that. However, she does not act like that. That picture was actually taken at Dogfest um, in Chester, um, in Cheshire, uh, not last year, not the year before, the year before that. Um, so 2019, I think. And uh, no, 2018, I think, yeah, 2018, that picture was taken. Um, and, uh, you know, she was there with obviously the, the hundreds and hundreds of dogs and people that go to Dogfest. Um, and she was fantastic. We did a demonstration in the arena. Um, and yes, you know, she wasn't like, you know, going up to every single dog and making friends with every, you know, every dog because she is what she is. But um, she wasn't trying to eat everybody. You know, she wasn't trying to eat all the little dogs. She was quite happy to just mind her own business and, and you know, be there with her mom and, um, you know, polite dogs she would allow to come up to her. Um, she was there with my girls as well. And again, she wasn't trying to eat them. Um, so, so yeah, you know, she, she is, she's a fantastic animal um, and I love her to pieces. Um, so the ethics of wolf dogs. Now this is a big question. Um, and it's a very personal question. It's, there's a lot of opinion in it. Um, personally, I think well-bred, well-raised, um, and dogs bred with a purpose, wolf dogs, um, there's nothing wrong with that um, because they are domestic animals. They are legally considered domestic animals. Um, the well-bred and well-raised ones will act like domestic animals as well to varying degrees of care requirements, and we'll come to that a little bit later on. Um, but the ethics comes in when just like, and, it, and it, it's it's exactly the same with any dog breed. The ethics comes in when you have bad and irresponsible breeders and irresponsible owners and people who get these animals just to have them in a pen, in a yard, like an ornament. They never do anything with them. They never take them out. They never socialize them. They don't give them any enrichment. And then they wonder why they act wild. They're not really wild, they're feral. 
you know, same as a, a dog can go feral. Um, they're just completely lacking um, in anything. Um, morning, Ellen. Um, it's, it's nice and early, <laughs> as you can probably tell from my voice. Um, so, so yeah, so the ethics is, is a big thing. Now, a lot of people say, oh, why breed wolf dogs when we have loads of breeds of dogs? And again, we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit. Um, oh, I've lost the comments. Where have they gone? Let me just one second. Let's just get that back up. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so we'll, again, we'll, we'll come to that uh, um, in a little bit. So, so the purpose of wolf dogs. Um, so we covered that a little bit in the history. Um, now the majority of the purpose of wolf dogs is just to be a companion. And that is the job of 99% of dogs in existence now. Um, there's very few, you know, when you think about it in the, the broad percentage of dogs and dog owners, there's very few that are actually working animals or that are doing the, the job that they were originally bred to do. Um, so their purpose predominantly is to be companion animals. You do get a lot of them, however, used in TV and film because it's much better than using wild animals um, or pure wolves because wolf dogs have those behavior modifications that make it much easier for them to work in those high stress environments. Um, we do also have some um, that do participate in, in dog sports and things like that. Um, we do modeling, like we've done modeling and, and a bit of filming with our guys as well. Um, I do public events work with them. One of my girls is actually um, trained as an assistance dog. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're very versatile um, if they're bred and raised correctly. And this is the big thing with them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so companions, you know, same as all of our dogs are, they're just a little bit more specialist companions, but in the same way that you wouldn't advise, you know, the majority of dog owners to go out and buy a Mali, um, you know, you're not going to go and advise the majority of dog owners to go out and buy a high content wolf dog either. So um, it, it's about right owners, you know, for, for the right animals. Um, and that is universal across all types of dog. Uh, and legality, we've, we've covered that a little bit already, but yeah, so it generally in most places, it's felal generation. So how many generations away from the last pure ancestor? Um, and in some places, it's based on the percentage um, of wolf within that animal. Um, so for the UK, as I say, for example, you talk in F, F3 and above, um, so F4, F5, F6, you can own as a normal domestic dog in the eyes of the law. Um, and, uh, and obviously anything below that you can still own, but you need your, your dangerous wild animal license, which there are still some people in the UK who have them and have that license. Um, but uh, they, again, it's, it's less of a domestic pet then because along with that licensing comes very specific requirements. Like they have to have, you know, enclosures, they can't go off of property, they can't go off of lead, they can't, you know, all these things that we'd like our dogs to be able to do basically, they can't, they're not allowed to by law. Um, so they're, they're less of sort of a pet um, in terms of, of the way we think of normal dogs. Um, whereas obviously the others, you know, if, if any of you have seen, uh, seen my guys, well, they go off lead, they run around, they play like other dogs. Um, you know, we go to public events, so we, we go all over the place. Um, so I'm just going to go and open the pen door to the puppy because she's crying to get into the others. Now she's finished her bone. I won't be one second. Hello, puppy. There you go. And her mum's come over straight away and stolen what's left of her bone because, <laughs> of course, she has. <laughs> Mummy's privileged. So I've spent the last 10 weeks feeding you, puppy. I'm, uh, I'm going to take back all the nutrition that I can. Uh, Ellen, so what generation are mine? Uh, I've got a range. Um, my lowest generation is an F7, uh, which is Millie. Who's here? Millie. I don't know if she'll come up. Mills. Come here, girl. You coming? She's like, no, mummy. I want this bone that's on the floor. We're all sniffling for it now. Mills. Come here. Up, up, up. Come here. Come closer. This is Millie, <laughs> it should pop up very briefly. Um, and my lowest is the little puppy at the moment who's about an F14, um, but that's through the saw loose in her, which again, we'll come to shortly. Um, so they vary a little bit um, depending on, on the content level um, and obviously the percentage for the legality of these animals. Um, so it's always really important to check where you are, what your laws say um, about owning them. Millie, Millie, don't eat the puppy. <laughs> I know she's climbing in your mouth. 
but don't eat her. Perfect. All right. So next slide. Um, we have got um, so wolf dog breeds and wolf dog types. Can you tell the difference in behavior and appearance between the different generations? Um, appearance, not necessarily. Um, behavior, absolutely. The reason the law is the way it is for generations is because um, the more generations away from the last pure ancestor you have, the more generations you have to select for the domesticated behaviors that you want. So you could have an animal like Eve, um, who obviously has an awful lot of wolf in her, um, but she acts pretty doggy, um, to be honest. You know, she goes out for a walk on a lead. She's social with strangers. She's tolerant of strange dogs. Um, she's not going to make friends with everybody, but she's, you know, she's tolerant enough. Um, you know, she doesn't eat the house when she's left on her own. She, you know, all of these kinds of things that you'd want from a dog. Um, but she, um, obviously, she's, she's very high percentage, but she's also multiple generations away from the last wolf in her line. Um, whereas you could have an animal that has less wolf in it than my Millie, for example. Um, the Millie has around 22% wolf specific DNA. Um, so you could have an animal that's less than that, but is closer in generations and would act more wild um, than Evie does because you've not had that amount of time to select for the behaviors that you would like. Um, and that's so that's why the law is that way, um, because it's those generations that give you that domesticated behavior um, and obviously the raising and, and selection of process as well. But that's the reason why it is um, like that. So you can still maintain a very wolfy look um, in an animal um, without necessarily having lots of percentage in them. Um, but the generations of behavior is, is the big thing. Um, and it's something I'm, I'm going to cover a little bit later on as well, um, because it's something that's very heavily involved in the development of the lupine dog, uh, which is my breed. Um, I am incredibly passionate about them, uh, could talk about them forever, um, but we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit later on. So the types and breeds of wolf dogs. So we've got a selection here on the screen. So the top two you've got up there, the Czechoslovakian wolf dog sometimes called the Czechoslovakian Valak or the CSV, and the Sarloos wolf dog are the two recognized, um, so registered with the FCI uh, Kennel Club breeds. So the Czech wolf dog was developed um, to be a military working dog. So they were Czech working line shepherds um, mixed with European or Carpathian wolves. Um, and they were selected and bred to be used for man trailing, border patrol, um, but having more endurance, um, better scenting ability, um, and an ability to independently work from their handler. Um, so that's why that pro that program was set up. Didn't didn't go very successfully, unfortunately. They couldn't get enough consistency as quickly as they would have liked. Um, but you know that's why that breed was developed. Millie, she's eating the puppy. <laughs> um, the Sarloos wolf dog is the one that they actually tried to develop um, for guide dog work. Um, so they wanted, again, that more independent thinking um, um, for a working animal, basically. So again, it's actually European wolf. So there is a little bit of American wolf in there as well, a little bit later on, um, and German shepherd again. But these obviously weren't, you know, high military drive working shepherds. These were more um, sort of show line or pet line working sh shepherds. Um, so they're a little bit less high energy, um, a little bit less drivey, uh, a little bit less um, sort of not reactive, but, you know, sharp is the way I kind of describe it. Um, but the reason that their program failed is because whether it came from the wolfy side or whether it came from not so well bred German shepherds, they are very shy and timid. They are not very social of strangers. They're not aggressive at all. Um, they just want to run away from everything. Um, something is scary. They're just going to take off. And Obviously, you don't want your guide dog doing that. It's, it's not very good. Um, so that is obviously the Sarloos wolf dog. So they're two, even though they have a very similar background, um, pretty much exactly the same genetic, you know, um, footprint as it were originally when they started. Um, they are two incredibly different animals now. Um, you check wolf dogs, you know, are still 
um, pretty bold, pretty confident, drivey, you know, active, want to be doing stuff, need a job to do kind of animals. And you saw Lucy, are you, you know, they're still quite sweet. Um, you know, if, if you're in a sort of like a, a less densely populated area, for example, um, they can still make a nice pet dog, but they are very shy. You know, if, if you are somebody who has people around the house all the time and things like that, they're not going to be very happy with that. If you live in a busy, you know, middle of the city, they're not going to be very happy with that. Um, they need nice, quiet lives, basically. Um, then the middle row we've got is the lupine dog, and this is a, a subject we're going to talk about in depth uh, a little bit later on. Um, this is the breed that I have. They're a breed in development at the moment. They've been in development for around 15, maybe 20 years now. Um, they come in three grades at the moment. It won't stay that way forever, I don't think, but at the moment we have three grades. We have classic, we have intermediate, and we have advanced. Oh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about the checks and the Sarloose is they wolf specific DNA wise, they are around 20 to 35% um, between the two of them. Um, the checks tend to be a little bit less, a little bit less wolf, more shepherd. The Sarloose tend to have a little tiny bit more wolf than, uh, than the, the checks do. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're what would be considered low content and they're very high felile generation. Um, you know, they've, they've not been back crossed to wolves for a long time. Um, you're talking, you know, 10 plus generations for them. Um, so lupines, yes, a classic, intermediate and advanced. So classics are what would be considered your normal domesticated dog. Um, they will live like a normal dog. They will act like a normal dog. They're basically just a large, you know, athletic dog breed that's really, really smart. Um, and the main thing with it is, is they are very free of health issues. Um, so we've been incredibly um, strict from the start with health testing, with temperament testing, um, and, uh, and everything else. So it means that we haven't allowed any genetic illnesses to sort of creep into the breed or anything like that. And we keep a very um, close eye on it by, guys, can you stop playing over there, please? Um, by monitoring it through genetic testing um, and DNA fingerprinting and things like that. And obviously your x-rays, but again, we're gonna to come to that later on. Uh, so your intermediates do require a little bit more specialist care. They may be shy of strangers. They may have a little bit of same-sex aggression. They may be escape artists. Um, so they do require a little bit more specialist care. Um, and then your advanced lupine dogs are, let's say, like Evie. Um, so she's still quite social with strangers, but she is very dog selective. She could, I mean, she can now, but she's not the rule um, when it comes to being left unattended in the house. Most of them would need some kind of secure containment. Um, so the lupines are graded not on percentage of wolf so much as behavior. Um, so the grades are based on a behavioral assessment alongside the physical side of things. Um, so we have um, vet and behavioral assessments done and videos sent to us and um, for all registered animals so they can be graded appropriately. Obviously the offspring of those animals, we don't need to do that so much because we know obviously consistency of behavior through generations, but um, any initial foundation animals are independently graded both behaviorally and physically. And again, that's something I'm going to get into uh, a little bit later on. Um, then we come to, um, I'll just briefly touch on American wolf dog actually in the middle of here, because the problem with um, the term American wolf dog is, is a catch all for any dog that is bred as a wolf dog, either in America or with American wolf content to it. Um, and it is a huge broad spectrum. Um, from, you know, really, really low content animals all the way up to really high content animals. Um, and there is so much variety in them. It is impossible to call them a breed. It's just a, a collection of these animals, basically. Um, so that's, if you hear people say American wolf dog, they're just talking about an animal that's got some American wolf content to it. There's, there's no specifics there um, for behavior or looks or anything like that. Uh, Tamascans, um, so we're coming to the, the, the wolf look-alike breeds now, as they call themselves. Um, so the Tamascans, um, of the three that I've got listed here, have probably the, the most wolf-specific DNA, but they are aiming towards less and less. Um, I think at the moment they have a cutoff of around 30%, but they are aiming for, you know, no more than 10 in their finished breed, because it's a breed and development stuff. Um, so again, they're generally pretty, um, pretty, 
I, I say easy dogs to own um, with regards to wolf dogs. Um, they do tend to have a significant amount of sled in them, so husky, malamute, um, and they were bred down from Alaskan racing huskies as well, a lot of the lines. So they're still really high drive, um, definitely more high drive than the lupines, um, who weren't bred from working animals really at all. Um, so they still tend to require a significant amount of exercise um, and um, and yes, they're, they're a little bit more demanding, but not, not all of them. Um, and there are lines that also have no uh, wolf specific DNA in them as well. Um, that's something that, you know, if, if you look into Tamascans, you'll see there is a little bit of variety there. They do have a breed club as well. Um, same as the Lupines, Lupines have the breed club, which is the World of Lupines Foundation. And um, the Tamascans have the International Tamascan Dog Register. Um, the Northern Inuit, the timber dog, um, I, I could list a huge number of um, varieties of this, the uh, Utonagan, um, the Caledonian wolf alike, all of those breeds came from the Northern Inuit originally. Um, so it was um, a couple of breeders um, who brought in a few dogs from America and used um, sled dogs and, and German shepherds and things over here as well um, and, uh, and created the, the Northern Inuit. Um, they have very, very little wolf specific DNA, generally 5% or less. Um, some of them now it's not even detectable anymore because they've been bred back to dogs so much. Um, they're very sled heavy. Um, they do have a chunk of shepherd in them as well, so it makes them more trainable, um, but they are generally still quite sleddy, and you see it in the curly tails and the, the very defined stop um, on them. And you can actually see it on the Tamascan picture there as well, that very defined stop that they have, um, which comes from the Huskies and, and the Mallies. Um, and uh, yeah, so they're, they're generally, um, you know, athletic family dogs kind of thing, that's what they're bred for. There are some that are used as assistance dogs as well, um, but they're the minority um, because they're generally too high energy and not enough focus for that kind of work. Um, but they do do dog sports and things like that. Um, and then from the Northern Inuit, originally the first split was the Utonagan, um, and they, they basically, there was a bit of a falling out between some of the breeders and they split. Um, then um, the Northern Inuit then had another split, um, but the Northern Inuits had several splits um, due to bad breeding practices, um, not correct health testing, um, falsifying of papers, all, all this kind of dodgy stuff that goes on very heavily in the dog world. The more you get into it, the more you find out. Um, not just with wolfies, but all breeds. Um, and uh, so they split off again, and then the, the, the Timber Dog Association was founded. Um, and then from the Utonagans, again, the same kind of thing, lots of really bad health testing practices and things like that. And that's where the Caledonian wolf alike came from. Um, so you've now got those four breeds that basically are the same breed, but they're not. Um, they have their own separate breed clubs, and they are starting to look a little bit distinct now, as you can see between the Northern Inuit and the Timber Dog that are there as, as examples. Um, there are some, some differences um, between them. So, um, yeah, it's it is what it is they're, they're wolf likes rather than wolf dogs and should be treated kind of as as such really they don't require much in the way of specialist care when it comes to actually being you know having a bit of wolf specific dna to them um right so that was a lot on on one little bit and i'm already halfway through and i'm not even halfway through my presentation care requirements so behavior again varies dramatically um depending on what kind of animal you have um if you want to have consistent behavior, you need to go for one of the recognized breeds. If you just get a generic wolf dog, and there are a lot of people out there breeding wolf dogs who aren't associated to any kind of breed club and things like that, um, then you, you kind of, you dive in at the deep end and you don't really know what you're gonna get in ways of consistency. Um, it's, you know, it's the same as anybody breeding sort of random mixes or um, pure breeds of, of sort of like non-recognized descent, you kind of, yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a minefield. Containment, super important. You hear this thrown around an awful lot in the uh, wolf dog community, containment. Now, if you're in America, people think containment means a big cage in your back garden, and they've got the space to do that, so that's fine. We do not have the space to do that here. We also generally don't like to keep our animals that way here in the UK either. Um, so containment is, is a big thing. Um, 
If you are looking to get something like a high content wolf dog or an advanced lupine, you will need some form of secure containment. Now, this may be secure kenneling, um, this may be, you know, an impact crate, you know, there's massive, pretty much solid metal, um, inescapable crates, um, because they can be pretty destructive when left, not because they are wild, they just get bored and they are supremely intelligent. Um, and they just investigate stuff with their mouths and their big feet and their big, big claws. And um, yeah, that can cause problems for a lot of people. So containment is a big deal for the, the more wolf specific DNA animals. Um, my guys don't have anything like that. We have a normal garden. Um, the only extra thing I have is I have a lean in on one side because the wall is only five foot high. Um, but you know, that you could say the same for, for pretty much most athletic dogs to be honest, you know, like, oh, five foot wall, I'll just pop over that, see you later, I'm going to go run around and chase the rabbits in the field next door. Um, in the house, you know, we have crates, um, they have the kitchen uh, when, when we're not home to supervise. Um, at the moment, we've got the pen up for the puppy, um, which is it's over there, you can just see it, they're, uh, they're wrestling on the couch right now. Um, <laughs> that's Mummy Bella, uh, Millie, and, and little puppy Lumi there, um, having a, a, a WWF on the on the sofa. So yeah, you know, and they still have access to their sofa whilst I'm out and things like that. They don't eat it once they're out of the puppy stage. Um, you know, they're they're pretty good. Um, I can sort of come home and not find the inside of my house in pieces. You know, excuse me, that's quite enough. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so containment, it, it depends on the animal that you have. Um, training methods, this is where things um, things get very grey. And, and it's something that um, bears a lot of parallels with some of the other talks we've had already um, about the large breed dogs. Um, Sean's talk yesterday about uh, her big fella pad, um, that there is a distinct line and mentality between um it's not necessarily just the men but the old school owners um uh, and a lot of them are men unfortunately and then um the younger generations that are coming through and the, the women owners as well um so you tend to find most of the owners that keep them locked up in pens who don't do anything with them who say they're wild animals and you can't do this and you can't do that and um are men uh, and generally older men as well. Um, whereas um, a lot of the, the newer generation and a lot of the female owners, we're just doing stuff with them, like they're dogs, because they're dogs. Um, and we're blowing them out of the water. Julie, who has Evie there, who you can see on the picture, um, that, that's us at, at Dog Fest there. Um, you can just see, see us here on the page. Um, yeah, you know, we, we go out and do normal dog things with them um, and and we treat them like dogs and we train them like dogs and we use all the positive training methods and force free and and they do great and they do things that the old school you know the old school wolf dog owners say is impossible to do with them um, and we prove very much that it is is really not it's all about how you've treated your animals rather than um, you know so much what they are um, so yeah, so lots of positive methods. If you use harsh methods with a wolf dog, um, then you're just going to get an animal that shuts down and doesn't want to do anything with you at all, just like a normal dog. You know, they, they become um, very fearful. Um, but the thing with a wolf dog is obviously if it is cornered, um, they are a big, powerful animal. And if you have intimidated and scared them with really harsh training methods and they have no escape, that is an incredibly powerful animal on your hands if it decides you know i've had enough like the only way out of this situation is to fight my way out it's, it's a big big problem um and obviously it's exactly the same with any other large breed dogs that you know suffer this same kind of um the same kind of harsh training um it's just it just ruins your relationship it can ruin the animal um and the i would say the big difference with with wolfies in that regard is they are not quick to forget or forgive. Um, if they have bad experiences with specific people or specific dogs, they don't forget it. They, I don't want to say hold a grudge, but they're going to remember you um, and they are not going to like you for a very long time. 
um, and thankfully it's not an issue I've had with my guys with with other people at all um, but we've had it with a few dogs um, unfortunately you know you get bad dog owners who let their dogs rush up and bark and growl in their face and they'll tolerate it the first few times but if your dog's done that to them three times now that's it they're like do not come near me I, I will you know I will stop this interaction <laughs> I've had enough of you um, and, and that unfortunately is is the way of life um, with with things uh, with you know irresponsible dog owners. We all come across it, and there are plenty of um, I would say like normal dog breeds. And I'm putting these in quotations because I'm not saying wolf dogs aren't a normal dog breed, but um, you know sort of like your, your regular breeds that that you know can also be like that. shepherds and things like that. For example, obviously they are generally pretty um, intolerant of of rude dogs as well. So, so yeah, so that is one of the probably one of the biggest definers between um, between the way that they are. And breed registries, uh, oh exercise, sorry, I've skipped that. Exercise, um, they're actually really different to what people think they are. Um, and people think the more wolves they are, the more um, they're going to need loads and loads of exercise. And actually, it's almost the opposite. Um, the the more wolf they are, the lazier they are. Um, it's all about preservation of energy. If they do not have to expend unnecessary energy running around, chasing something to eat it, etc., they're not going to. They're, they're like, no, that's a waste of my energy. Why would I do that? Um, do I ever experience a winter wolf syndrome in my multi-dog household? No, and winter wolf syndrome is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a misnomer, really. Um, it's just hormonal changes associated with the breeding cycle um, and it's seen predominantly in adolescent wolf dogs um, so they're like oh yeah the first winter they were fine the second winter they were terrible and well yeah they're, they're you know they've just hit the throes of adolescence their hormones are going absolutely wild um, and th they just don't know how to manage themselves um, with especially with higher content wolf dogs. So you don't tend to see it so much with low and mid content, although there are definitely some changes. Um, they, um, they, they have a very specific breeding cycle. So they, they come into, the girls come into season, late winter to springtime, and the boys are generally only fertile um, late winter to springtime. Um, puppy, what are you doing? the puppies now underneath my kitchen cabinet being very cute and silly um and uh, and so obviously during that time their hormones are amped up massively um and even in our normal domestic dogs we we know very well um if you keep entire animals that those hormones can you know can affect behavior um and you know it's the same as with us. You know hormones hormones are a pain in the ears. Um, so you you do see it. Um, it's just yeah, it's just breeding hormones. They can't help it. Um, they but generally and and they they if they've been raised correctly, they can become way more intolerant of other strange dogs. But they shouldn't ever see it as an issue with people and this is something i'm going to talk about in in raising later on because it does make a big difference in how they are raised to how they react to people um and they're they're sort of like their behaviors with people um is it mainly males or can females have this too um so you will see the changes in behavior in both males and females um to be honest my girls are generally worse um with the the noticeability of the change as it were um my boy just gets a little bit more nose sniffy and a little bit more interested in the girls um at sort of this time of year um and a little bit less tolerant of stupid behavior from other dogs um but um the girls yeah they're the ones that are, they just don't take any nonsense at this time of year that's like no get out of my face but they're still fine with me don't get any aggression at all um with me evie's the same with her owner no aggression with her owner or anything at all she's just less tolerant of you know the other dogs in the household kind of thing but that's the same with with you know regular dogs as well when when they're in season they kind of they don't really want to be messed about with and poked and prodded and jumped on and you know all of the things that dogs do with each other um so yeah so winter wolf syndrome generally it's an excuse for bad breeding and bad handling um not so much an actual 
behavioral trait as it were um it does still occur but it's it's the sexual hormone change rather than you know anything anything sort of mystical that they like to to show it as as it were oh winter wolf syndrome oh it's like no um it's something that you should be prepared for guys can you stop that please bella 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 yes you missus come on stop winding her up thank you good girl um yeah it's something that should be you know plenty manageable um and so breed registries was the last thing i was going to get to um which is there are uh, breed specific registries for um certain types of wolf dogs um generally any reasonably responsible breeder will be associated with one um so whether it be the Tamascans, whether it be Wilder Lupines Foundation, whether it be the breeders of the Czechs and the Sarloos, et cetera. Um, yeah, if, if they're breeding willy nilly um, without some kind of breed registry, then guys, stop it. Come on, stop it, please. Stop messing about. Thank you. Um, then, uh, then yeah, the, the, there's usually a reason for that. And it's probably because they're not health testing. It's probably because they're not temperament testing. Um, there, there'll probably be a number of things in there that you should be avoiding them for. Okay, so what should be the second half of my presentation, but is um, got to be squeezed into 15 minutes. <laughs> raising wolf dogs, uh, different development stages, uh, responsibilities in raising and ethical breeders. This is my girl Bella and her not most recent litter, the litter two years ago. Um, so we had we had eight beautiful little babies there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so let's have a look. -see. So the foundation. Um, so I breed um, under the World of Lupines Foundation. Um, <laughs> no, Ellen, it's absolutely fine, don't worry. Anything I can't come to um, in the talk, I will uh, answer you afterwards in the comments, so don't worry. Um, um, so yeah, um, so I breed under the World of Lupines Foundation breed registry. I breed, you know, lupine dogs, um, which is a specific type of wolf dog, because um, wolf dog is kind of a catch-all phrase, just like spaniels, not all spaniels are cocker spaniels or cavalier king Charles spaniels, but they're all spaniels. Um, but they all obviously have different traits and, and different behaviors you know within their separate breeds in the group so wolf dogs is the same checks are different to star loose are different to lupines and so on and so on um so the foundation of the animals that you are breeding from is so so important within the world of lupines foundation we do health testing so that's my girl bella's hips on there you can see they're pretty perfect they came out at a three three which i was very very happy about she's got you know clear elbows as well she's had bva eye tests um so for, for those who are in america or other countries um three three and, and clear and zero zero um they're British Veterinary Association um, gradings for hips, elbows, um, and eyes. Um, you can see she's got her embark up there as well. She doesn't carry any genetic illnesses. Um, she's clear of, of everything. Um, and then obviously knowing your lineages as well. So um, we've got Jack and Bella there who were the parents of the litter you saw on that first picture. And then we've got the parents and grandparents of the most recent litter that we've just had. Guys, shush, shush, you've been so noisy. They're just playing, but they're loud. <laughs> um, so yeah, knowing obviously your, your parents and their parents and, and any health issues or behavioral issues and things like that. And then obviously we also have the behavioral grading system, which is super important. Any animal that is being registered as a foundation animal for the world of lupines, so that's like a, an open stud book animal that's, that's being grandfathered in, has to have an independent behavioral evaluation. They need to go to a vet or a trainer or a behaviorist and have an assessment that's filmed and sent to us. Um, they also have a sort of like a pretty in-depth questionnaire as well that asks the owner about how they live, how do they have to keep them, what are they like with other dogs, um, and there's parts of their assessment that are like that as well. Um, and then that's how we grade them, classic, intermediate or advanced, depending on those behaviours. If we have animals that are sort of borderline, we will always grade up just to be safe. It's better to have a home that's overqualified than underqualified for an animal. Um, so those are the, the three big things that before you even start thinking about breeding, you need to be doing. And that honestly should be the same with every single dog breed. We know it's not, 
Um, <laughs> you know, we, we've all come across dogs who haven't been health tested, dogs who are just bred from two random dogs and they have no idea of the lineages or anything like that. Um, dogs with hidden genetic disorders that crop up when they're four or five years old and debilitate them for the rest of their lives. Um, so one of the things with the Welder Lupines Foundation and the reason for the, the creation of the lupine breed is we wanted to create a large athletic companion animal that was free of any health, physical or behavioural extremes. And that is something that is lacking. Um, I, I don't you know, th there are no dogs that don't have one of those. Um, so generally dogs that are pretty physically healthy are behaviorally very problematic for dog owners. Um, you know, all your working type breeds um, are very, you know, high energy, high drive, need very specific outlets for behaviors. Um, and that obviously can be very problematic for, for pet owners, for companion owners. Um, and then likewise, the other way, if you get the dogs that are pretty good at being, you know, just chilled out companion animals, most of them have some kind of health issue or physical issue, um, brachyphelic breeds, you know, the countless genetic disorders that affect so many dog breeds. Um, and part of it is irresponsible breeding, absolutely. Part of it is people just wanting things that look cute, like the brachyphelic dogs that are so extreme these days, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, and, and some of it is just, you know, we didn't have the technology when these breeds were created to know about these hidden genetic disorders. Um, and dogs were bred before conditions showed up and then it was too late and then, you know, and off it went kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. So from creating a breed, as we are now with all the technology that we have um, and the knowledge that we have we can we can stop that before it starts you know we can we can stop any of these illnesses creeping into the breed before it gets going and we can monitor so if anything does crop up we have got dna fingerprints of every single animal in the breeding program so we know exactly where it came from and we can sort of like right okay well that that line there unfortunately we, we can't breed that line anymore because it's showing this genetic illness um, it also means that it allows us to work with companies like embark to um, diagnose illnesses we're also working with them on the specifics of uh, genetic um, domestication um, genes so they're, they're looking for markers for genetic domestication genes um, and all sorts of things like that which is really really exciting um, so some, some great stuff that's going on there so moving swiftly on because i am very pressed for time um i've only got eight minutes um so during the pregnancy and preparing for the whelp so caring for mommy and the pregnant bitch um is huge amounts of food making sure she's getting her scans making sure she's having uh, the progesterone blood tests for the mating and timings and things like that um making sure that she is kept really calm and relax and there's no stress because that uterine environment does affect the growth of the puppies not just physically but also behaviorally as well there are studies that show um stress within the mother um, while she's pregnant has a dramatic behavioral effect on the puppies so that's something that's really important to, to obviously keep calm um, getting them used to their their whelping box in their area having quiet time away from the rest of the pack um, or family unit, whatever you want to call it. I call my guys a pack because they're a pack of dogs, um, not because I think they're a pack of wolves, because they're not. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the, the general term for a group of dogs. Um, so she needs quiet time within the last few weeks of her pregnancy, especially away from the others. Um, so I will start sleeping downstairs with her separately from the others. So I sleep on the couch just here. You can see at the side of the, the picture, she sleeps in her whelping box. Um, usually before the puppies are born, she'll actually sleep on the sofa with me and then she goes in a welcome box afterwards. But yeah, so we get her used to her space so she's not stressed about the change when the puppies arrive. And the big thing, changes in hormonal behavior. The last two weeks of their pregnancy, they do not want um, the majority of the other animals around them. Um, so we have four cats as well. Um, and I've got my four adult adult lupines bella has a very tentative relationship with my oldest female lupine they're never going to be bestest friends they've had a few scraps um so especially when um it, you know they're in season or um you know they're pregnant they are kept away from each other in those last couple of weeks because that's when fights will happen and you know if you think about it in a, a natural situation that's when they would sort of go to ground um in the den and they wouldn't see any of the other 
you know, any other mem members of the family um, for, you know, a good couple of weeks um because they want that safety they're looking for that they call it nesting um with with humans you know we, we tidy everything and we want everything perfect and we don't really want to be around people and we're very sort of like nervous of it um and and dogs obviously go through those same hormonal changes so they want their quiet time away from the rest of the family unit and it's really important to give them that okay next the whelp so oh it's both amazing and hard and sometimes absolutely heartbreaking i'm sorry we um in our latest litter we lost um a puppy and we had uh there was there was 10 puppies um but unfortunately the last one was was stillborn nothing could be done i i tried for an hour to bring it back around it had swallowed so much amniotic fluid on its way out because it took a long time to come down it was born five hours after all the others um and uh and yeah, and obviously that that's really heartbreaking. Um, and then you can see me there on the picture looking absolutely horrendous, <laughs> like sleep deprived um, with a little puppy stuffed in my jumper. So that was little Dawn. Um, she she was from our latest litter. Um, she's she's little Lumi who's running around my kitchen causing chaos right now. Um, sister, she almost didn't make it when she was born. She had. Uh, not only pooed in her sack, she breathed in as well. Um, and it took me six hours of very intense work warming her and um, getting her to uh, take a glucose syrup um, from a little tiny dropper on a syringe to get her energy levels up. Guys, please do not fight under the table underneath me. Thank you. <laughs> Wrestling under the bench. Um, and yeah, and it took, you know, hours and hours in the middle of the night for her to, to come around. Um, and that massive smile on my face on that picture there is because that was the first time she fed from her mum after six hours. Um, and uh, and we sort of, we then took her off, kept her warm again and then put her back in. And after sort of three, three times of swapping around warmth, feed, warmth, feed, she then stayed in with the others. And she's doing amazing now. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, that, you know, it's, it's really, really hard stuff to go through um whelping a dog is is difficult you've got to do so much research before you even think about it 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 terrifies me the number of people who just go oh, yeah we'll just breed our dog to the dog down the road and and they have no idea what they're doing and then when things go badly wrong during the birthing process they don't know what's happening they could lose the whole litter they could lose their girl um it's it's hard it really is um and uh, it, it's not something to be taken lightly at all um it's something that you really need to you know get a mentor it's, it's one of the best things i can advise for anybody thinking about doing that um so the big difference between what we do and what the old school stereotypical american wolf dog owners do and the reason that you see so many differences is we do not let our dogs give birth in a hole in the ground in a yard. Um, we do not pull and bottle feed our puppies from like two days old um, because our dogs know us. They're happy for us to be with them when they whelp. Um, Bella looks for me actively for support. So Bella is normally daddy's girl um, and she when when she knows it's sort of baby time she will gravitate to me she will not leave my side she she wants me to be there i am her safety net um, and that is a huge difference between what you see with the american wolf dogs and what you see obviously with um lupine specifically but also a lot of your european bred wolf dogs as well there's far more human interaction and that does play very heavily in how those animals develop so next slide so now the hard work begins I've literally got two minutes left to fit in so much. So we do early neurological stimulation. Um, you can see me doing it there. I think that might actually be a little dawn there in my hands on the picture with a little cotton bud on her foot whilst mommy's feeding the others. Um, we do um, litter tray training. Um, the big thing is that they will actually develop faster um, than most uh, other dog breeds. Um, so our guys quite often start eating solids um by by sort of two weeks they will um they'll have their eyes open at, at sort of seven to 
10 days old. Um, I have a massive video diary of both this and the previous litters, birth, um, you know, raising process, etc. on YouTube. I'll put some links in the comments later on. You can also check out our Facebook page. Um, we have a page for the kennel where I document absolutely everything because I completely believe in being very transparent um which is the cook and why lupine dogs um again i'll pop some links and things in the comments later on um and puppy please don't eat my blanket <laughs> so yeah so there's a lot that goes on we also start desensitization really really early um uh we start you know sound desensitization um playing fireworks and traffic and kids sounds and like all sorts of stuff um from a really really early age literally as soon as their ears open we start um, so moving house, from two weeks onwards, they come out of the whelping box, out of the little tiny pen, and they go into a big pen, they have their litter tray, you can see them there just starting to use the litter tray, they get introduced to the other household members, so our other dogs, our cats, um, they start exploring the big wide world, um, we do more desensitization, we do, so we, we follow puppy culture for our puppy raising, so we do barrier, you know, challenges, um, we start recall training, we do clicker training, we start separation practice in crates, we do food handling. Um, one of the big things with wolf dogs is resource guarding, so we work on that from a very, very young age as well. Um, and we make sure that they don't have any issues with the resource guarding either. I'm flying through these now because it's seven o'clock. Um, so one of the other big things is they tend to go through the fear periods as puppies much earlier. Um, so um, they'll hit the first fear period usually around four weeks old. Um, and uh, and the reason that the fear period kick, fear period kicks in is because up until that point there has been no reason for these little puppy animals to have any fear response to anything because they wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. They can't run away, they can't defend themselves, um, and uh, so there's no point having this sort of fear response, and that's why you do a, a lot of your desensitization before the fear period kicks in. And that's the same for all dog breeds, um, but these guys tend to hit those fear periods a little bit earlier um, because they're progressing through the stages a bit earlier. One of the big things I noticed is how mobile my guys are compared to um, a lot of other dog breeds um, for similar ages and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so then we do car travel. We do uh, we go outside, we go in the garden, we get them used to water, uh, we get them used to leash training, and, and obviously we do vaccinations, um, microchips, all that kind of stuff that you should do as a good breeder as well. Okay, and then the last little tiny bit. Um, so when they leave, so we do, um, we have puppy packs. We have waiting lists, that's a massive thing for us. So we don't just breed and then go, oh, I've got puppies for sale. We have waiting lists. Some some people waiting for our puppies have been waiting for them for two or three years. Um, so we breed to a waiting list. We don't just have loads of puppies kind of lying around everywhere. Um, and we provide lifetime backup for our puppies. Um, so that means, anything happens at any point that puppy could be 10 years old i'm here it comes back to me if it needs to we'll we'll work on it um i do puppy training as obviously a trainer as well so um i obviously get them heavily involved in that at the moment we can't do face-to-face -face training in the uk here um so i run online classes through puppy school um and four of my my nine most recent litter and obviously lumi who's still here as well so five um are going through the training classes as well um, and obviously we have the World of Lupines Foundation ethical breeder requirements, um, which means I get independently um, sort of assessed, as it were, by my puppy owners. Um, so they get sent a questionnaire by the breed club all about how did I do, what did I do, how did they find the experience, um, just to make sure that the breeders within the World of Lupines Foundation are sticking to the rules, making sure that we are doing things as ethically as we can and being as responsible for our puppies as we can. And just up there in, in the top corner of the screen in the plant pot, that is Dawn, that little tiny puppy who almost didn't make it is now doing amazing with her family. And I'm so proud. Um, I, I love her to death. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we do we do a lot. And I've had to rush through this last bit because it's now three minutes past seven and there are other amazing speakers um, who are starting their talks right now. Um, I've watched so, so many of them. Um, I've still got a few to catch up on, but it's been absolutely brilliant. Massive, massive props and congratulations to Ruby for putting this together. Um, 
I only got involved very, very last minute, um, literally the, the day the event started because I only found out about it. Um, so there was a little bit of a, a bit of a rush. But um, but yeah, I'm really glad I've been here. I'm really glad I have been able to watch um, so many of these amazing speakers and pick things up so much. Um, and yeah, anybody who has any further questions, obviously there's going to be a bunch of people watching this on playback because no one's up at this time of the morning on Sunday. You know, come on, we're not daft. I'm only up because I've got a baby puppy. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, so any questions, please put them in the comments. I will answer as many as I possibly can. I'll put the links to uh, the kennel. I will put the links to the breed registration program, the Waterloo Pines Foundation, because we do education work as well, as I've said. Um, and yeah, and any other questions, obviously, please ask away. But I hope this has been informative um, for those of you who don't have much experience with wolf dogs. I hope this is informative for people who only have limited experience with wolf dogs, whether it be the American type or the European type or a bit of a mix in between. Um, and I hope it gives you a bit more of a, an idea and an understanding as to to why um, why I love them so much and why they're brilliant. So lovely. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Go and see the rest of the amazing speakers that are on, um, and take care. It's been fantastic.